boom. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are on site in San Jose at the Convention Center at the American Anthropological Association. Their AAA is having their annual meeting, and we are getting to sit down with some of their anthropologists that are professors. They're in academia. They are researchers. They are studying biology, or they are studying uh, archaeology or linguistics their, or cultural anthropology. There's so much to apply to anthropology. It's so fascinating. And I'm like, I'm, a, I'm a kid in a knowledge haven right now. <laughs> it's so amazing. Um, and we are our first guest as we sit down. We have Dr. Elise Waterston joining us on the show. Uh, Elise was the vice president of the AAA in 2013-2015. She was the president of the AAA from 2015 to 2017. So that's already like four major years of AAA involvement. That's, that's a lot of work. It's mm -hmm. a big organization. There's like almost 6,000 people here. Yes. Yeah, that's a huge organization. And so you're, you're cult she's a cultural anthropologist and professor of anthropology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice at the City University of New York with a focus on how systemic violence and inequality influence society. She's a six-time author. She has an ethnographic book called My Father's Wars, which we'll talk about. And we will also talk about her upcoming book called Light in Dark Times, The Human Search for Meaning. So, wow, Elise, what a cool background. Um, this, Thank you so much, Alan. You are so cool. This is gonna be super <laughs> fun. So. Um, how does one like you tell us about your uh, story about how you got into anthropology? Okay, well, first of all, I really enjoy the way you described, um, uh, you know, your excitement about anthropology and all of its different <laughs> aspects. And it's what's what's um, so true. You really hit on something really very true about the discipline, which is, um, you know, it, it's students of it, introduction to anthropology learn it's a holistic discipline. And it sounds, you know, almost trite after a while, but it is so true because most other disciplines take a slice of reality and take a look at it, whether it's economics or whether it's religion or some other aspect of, of life, social life, um, um, or biological life or whatever, um, and, um, and, and examine it, which is a good thing. But anthropologists start with the big picture. It's holistic and it says, okay, here we have the big picture and how do we understand all the different parts and how they're connected with one another. And that's what I love about anthropology. So without giving you a long-winded description of how I got into it, I will tell you that I started out in my 20s as, an, as a school teacher in Brooklyn and I um, started to do research in my own community. It was a very poor community. And my big question, um, I didn't study anthropology as an undergraduate, but my big question as a person living in the world um, and living in a, a very poor neighborhood working with children who um, were really struggling with um, sort of structural vulnerabilities, um, I, I wanted to understand more deeply how could, in the wealthiest nation in the world, and this is the 1970s, there be so much poverty? And when I went to figure out, I need to study this, and I, I, I couldn't go on, there was no internet to go Google disciplines. I had majored in psychology as an undergraduate, so I went to the library and I studied different of the social sciences to see and I landed on anthropology. And once <laughs> I landed on anthropology and read up yeah, on it, yeah. I knew it would never, ever go away. It wouldn't end. And it hasn't. Your interest wouldn't end. It would not end. <laughs> yeah. It's really endless. Yes. So cool. The, you're, you're speaking about it from such a multidisciplinary perspective, which mm -hmm. is what our show is all about. And so it's very awesome that anthropology is a huge the study of humans is such a huge multidisciplinary field. Mm -hmm. So when you when you see the inequalities and when you see, you ask yourself, you know, what is how what is the root of this? You know, how can we get to the roots? Not the not the not not solving them from a a aesthetic 
perspective, but solving them from a roots, systemic perspective? Well, the thing is, um, uh, um, anthropologists often say, and then people glaze their eyes o over when they hear anthropologists say, it's complicated. <laughs> but it is complicated. And so one of the things that um, you know, I, d I discovered when I was in, in graduate school trying to understand the world was um, what those different aspects are, are that are forces that shape what human lives are uh, become. And so that's why you mentioned, you know, biological, anthropology, and archaeology, historical, and ling language, and linguistics, and cultural. So, so um, you know, if we're going to understand something like poverty, you can't have a simple, simplistic or simple one-liner answer to it. But you do have to look at the ways in which the interplay of power yes. and politics yeah. and economics and the economic organization of a society and its political structures and its political ideology all play into creating the field within which people live out their lives. And so often we refer to that field in a society like ours as a structurally unequal field. And so that doesn't mean to say that human beings living within that or on that field are just, um, you know, uh, complete and total victims, uh, you know, of the structures. It means that we have to look at the ways in which human beings interact with the systems in place, the institutions, the social institutions of society, everything from the family, which is a social institution, to you know, uh, you know, when you deal with issues around poverty, for example, the marketplace, money, the hmm? money as well, a money, exchange of, course, of value the, the, between people. Yeah. Well, yes, and that has to do with the economic organization yes. of society, and then, but all the other institutions, like you know, the marketplace is an institution. But you know, when you think about poverty, and you see how po poverty is. Um, uh, criminalized, so you have to look at things like the criminal justice institution. If you're going to uh, talk about, po you're going to when, when you think about poverty, when you think about um, poverty, you think have to think about what pe how human beings satisfy their basic needs, food. So we know we have food insecurity, shelter. We know we have issues around housing and homelessness. But these are not just separate, segmented aspects. It all comes together to a big picture about to uh, help us understand uh, how human beings navigate uh, on this unequal field and to also to navigate it for sustenance and survival but also navigate it to um, uh, enjoy life yeah to 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 have love in their lives and to have joy in their lives yes. um, even amidst hardship and difficulty yes and that's in human search for meaning is you know in in the upcoming book that you're writing about so you know the the way that you, you know you're describing it's so beautiful humans want to have the basic necessities they want to have the 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 highest emotions and feelings that one can feel during their lives as well so how does how did you go from uh, being becoming fascinated with anthropology to uh, becoming a professor writing books being a leader a head leadership of AAA? So these are great questions and um, um, uh, I, uh, I have to think through uh, ha the short version of a long life history. <laughs> so let me try to, to answer your question. That um, So as I said, once I discovered anthropology, I knew it was go never going to go away. I didn't start graduate school until I was 29 or 30 years old. And, um, and I got through that and then ultimately uh, I, but I've been in New York, and so my field, r my research, my field work was in New York. Um, I have a couple of books uh, out about urban poverty in the U.S. Uh, so one book is on women and hom homelessness in New York City, and I have another book about the, st the street drug scene in New York during the 1980s. So these are all issues around poverty. So it is an urban poverty sort of subfield within the field of cultural anthropology. Mm -hmm. um, um, and I, I uh, came to John Jay College in 2003, and um, it was it was wonderful to be part of that um, department and the institute and, and the institution of higher education there, because um, I was very much nurtured to fulfill my own potential in my, what I wanted to do with my work. 
One of the reasons I love working at CUNY and at John Jay is that um, it's a public university and I believe in the public, um, a public education. So um, I, I'm thrilled to work in, a, in that kind of institution and I think we need to support our public institutions which are not getting enough support. Um, but our students are um, primarily working class, um, working poor, students of, of color, and new immigrants. And uh, ma many of, m most, are first generation college students. And I love working with our students because uh, they are there because they want to be there. They are there because they, um, they want to find, they're, they're aspirational and they really uh, are very dedicated to um, <laughs> really at my school trying to participate in the world to make it a better place. So you know the university, the college has a tagline educating for justice and uh, when you walk into the building of, of my university, uh, of my college at John Jay, there's a big wall of words next to justice. And so it's you know criminal justice, and there's social justice, and there's economic justice, climate justice, um, gender justice, racial justice, yeah. and poetic justice. They actually have poetic yeah. justice on the wall, and it's and it's the, it's it's you know it's true. It's it's a place where we explore the idea of justice from multiple angles, and working with our students has just been a great honor and my greatest pleasure. Well, so many variances of justice. That, yes. Yeah, that are, wow. Um, will you just give us a quick one sentence or on, on justice? Well, to me, justice has to do with fairness. I mean, and, and of course, we can interpret justice in many ways, as I just said. But so what we do in our department is really focus on social justice. And even that, we can unpack that those two words. Yeah. But basically, um, it's about, um, for me, it is about um, understanding the, um, uh, those um, multiple obstacles to providing opportunity for people to fulfill their own potential. And where there is injustice means that there are forces in place, there are structures in place, and then there are, for, there, there is, um, there are powerful forces that inhibit the ability for every individual to fulfill that potential. And we call that structural violence. Okay, so that's a good way to put it. So then there's this, actualization potential of every human mm -hmm. and then the obstacles that are in the way uh, that are socially constructed um, mm -hmm. are uh, v social violence that's social it's a violence. form of violence form and of it's violence. invisible yeah because you don't see it it's not yeah. like if I punched you in the nose yeah you would see it but structural violence is more invisible so it's very difficult to even talk about it because it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction but you yeah. can un you can take it apart and and look at all those different structures and systems and see the ways they work and at the same time not reduce human beings to uh, you know simply uh, the victims of such structures and systems they are we all are we are also actors though in the world yeah. too yeah. and we find spaces in between to actualize as as much as possible. It doesn't mean everybody can fulfill that potential because if they if they if it's if the playing field is uneven, then you're you know, it's difficult to find social justice. <sighs> but I didn't answer your question about how I got to AAA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, let's get should there. I, should yes, I go there? Let's do there. So um, you know, you you mentioned earlier that there are six thousand people here at the conference. Mm -hmm. And it's very intimidating, especially for a junior scholar when you first come in and it's like, oh my God, everybody knows everybody else and I don't know anybody and oh my God, and who's that and who's this? And people are looking at my name tag, you know, they're looking at my name to see if I'm anybody important and I'm really not important and it's very intimidating and I was very intimidated. Um, but it was, for me, it was the AAA the, that actually enabled, the, as the organization, that enabled me to really, um, um, uh, it helped me um, develop a wonderful network of f 
friends and colleagues in, uh, around the world, and uh, to really find my own sense of anth my anthropological self. Yeah. And so I met people, and then I was invited. You always need somebody to bring you in, mm. I think. So I was invited by Mar Maria Vespiri to um, write something for a publication through the AAA that she was involved in. Um, and um, that invitation opened the door for me. And, and then I submitted the piece, the written piece, and she liked it, and then she asked me to serve as an editor for something, and I did that, and mm. then from there it just grew. And then I, be I volunteered um, in various capacities through the association, and um, the more I, I, I did that, the more people came to me and asked me to participate in other things mm -hmm. and do this committee and that entity and the other thing. And so eventually it got to the point where, um, you know, I became a, a, an elected member of the exec. I was on various committees related to the transition to electronic publishing, for example, that was earlier, yeah. and on the long range planning committee, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then s I was elected to the executive board and then somebody on the executive board <laughs> watched me and wanted to nominate me for president and I, I said I don't think so and then she said yes so and she did and then uh, then I became president <laughs> <laughs> I was elected so that's how I, I, I that was my trajectory it's one step at a time yes and it's a lot of work and dedication but you know I really believe that the association which is designed to advance um, the discipline of anthropology which is a marginal discipline in the world so it's very important that we have our professional organization that can help all of us advance our discipline. Yes. And um, it, it really accomplishes an enormous amount. It um, doesn't necessarily always get credit for what it does, but uh, in my book, it's, it's, a, it's a really great, strong organization that does help us as anthropologists um, um, produce and disseminate knowledge and information which is what it's all about. Yes, about humans and about culture, about behavior, mm -hmm. about everything around us. Exactly. And, and these abstractions as well are very important to understand. Now, as you were speaking, you were talking about these, you know, the committees, and as I was walking through, I was looking at all the different committees, some of the different committees, and holy cow, there's so many, and yes. you're working on so many different things here. And it, you're, the way that you work through it totally makes sense. Now, um, so you started professing you started professing in 2003? 2003 was where I got the full-time position as a, as a um, professor, 15 yes. 15 years now, that's a long time. That's awesome. Yeah. So maybe give us a quick bit on what have been some of your favorite learning processes as a, as a professor and your engagements with students, your ability to expand mm. their minds to new ways of thinking. Okay, so I will give you um, one example. Um, I'm actually teaching a brand new course right now that I, I could share with you as well. Let's do it. But, but first I'm gonna start with a course that I really enjoyed teaching. Um, uh, that's, uh, because we're a school of criminal justice, a lot of, the, um, a lot of the courses have names that sound, that are kind of, have a, a criminal justice or something like that hook. Um, so there's this one course that's called Culture and Crime. And when I would teach that course, I would ask the students, uh, you, know, in, 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 you know, the first day of class, what do you think this course is going to be about? And they um, invariably say, well, it's going to be, why do, you know, some cultural groups commit certain crimes? And why is it, you know, so, and, and, and I knew that that's what they would say. You know, they would, it was almost like demonizing cultural groups, you know, before we even started about, you know, why does, why do they, commit crimes and why do they commit these kinds of crimes you know so it was those kinds of things that I knew they would say and I said and I always would say well actually this course is going to be very intense but it's about crimes of power war and genocide mm. culture and crime whoa and so it's you know a tough course um, but, um, you know, it, um, we really, I used a lot of different um, kinds of interdisciplinary literature um, from anthropolo anthropological works to poetry to, uh, you, know, to you know, to um, have students understand um, war and political violence and um, crimes against humanity in those kinds of ways and genocide. 
and um, had them produce works um, in multiple formats, like in um, um, graphic format or you know um, different kinds of narratives and things like that. So we I used multiple different uh, approach writing approaches to have them articulate what they were learning. And um, in, at my school, um, often there is the military recruiting students. And our students are vulnerable to being recruited by the military because, um, you know, they are working class, working poor students. And um, sometimes they, you know, in the literature, is, the recruitment literature is very appealing. It's, you know, we'll pay for your education, we'll, you know, and um, so forth. And um, so, at, but I had students come up to me after this class and say, you know, I had the papers to join the military in my pocket, but after this course, there is no way I'm joining the military. And the thing is that I, you know, I didn't propagandize. I didn't say, oh, you know, you shouldn't join. It was never about that, but yeah. it was about under. Let's study war. Yeah. Let's study specific wars. Let's study what philosophers have said about war. Let's study what anthropologists have learned by going into war zones, those kinds of things. And, um, and then that got them thinking, and then they realized that this decision to enter the armed forces really requires careful, deep consideration and not just an automatic, you know, I'll do it because I'll get an education for my mm -hmm. love, pay for my schooling. Mm -hmm. And um, so that to me is an accomplishment because we want the students to think for themselves and think critically. We always say that, oh, we're gonna teach <laughs> students to think critically, but then actually we don't, you know, because we don't really give them the tools often enough for them to think critically. So that's one example. Now, I won't go into details of this course I'm teaching now, but it's a writing course. Can um, we just quickly on the last thing that you said? Sure. Wow. The, there's so many variables that go into why we have war. And yes. when we break them down at, at their roots and we try and find some sort of peace, love, and understanding on the planet, there is less of a need for war. Uh, and hopefully, in the, within this century we can find some sort of world peace uh, it's something that we care about a lot and that we talk about a lot and it, 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 it there's a there is a big shift towards towards heart coherence the sort of of empathy and emotional intelligence that people can carry with their with their stewardship for earth and with their care for each other that I think could get us there and I think is is starting to get us there in many ways so I'd be interested to see how much you um, here at, at AAA also sp speak on, on on world on world peace and well okay yeah. so a couple of comments in response yeah. to what you just said number one is that um, there can't be peace without justice okay so that's one thing because we can have peace and people could you know not war and people can be really immiserated, if you accept that word. I mean, you know, um, have lives that are very difficult because of these conditions that, you know, are not peaceful. That invisible violence that I was talking about earlier. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other thing is that um, we, well, we, we have to look at the political economics, the political economy of war, historically, and in the present. And, you know, one quickie way to kind of get a picture of it is looking at the budgets, the military budgets. And so we, in our society in the U.S., the military budget keeps growing. 800 billion now. And, and um, you know, so we've got to follow the money, follow the money, and then follow the relationships to, um, you know, um, to the, um, um, the, the, um, 
to like other countries, the geopolitical relationship? Well, the two, no, but I'm talking about follow the money and the um, tools and technology of oh. war. Oh, yeah. And how these are produced and reproduced and sold and, you know, and, and how there is a market for war. Yes, you know, so, yes. and I'm not reducing war to that, but I think it's an important piece Part of, of it, it that we yeah. have to really understand. And billions um, of dollars of weapons moving around the world, yeah. Right, so you have to look at those kinds of big picture factors, and then you have to look at the ideological factors, the sort of the rhetoric around war. And um, I was in a panel on Wednesday called Cowardice, hmm. and unpacking that concept. And you know, one of the hmm. you know the part of the discussion in that panel was that you know there's often I hear this all the time that people say, oh human beings will always be at war because they always were and they always will it's in our genes <laughs> it's in our nature yeah. and you laugh but this is people say it all the time it's, yeah you yeah. you know at thanksgiving yeah. time go ask just bring the subject up and at your own family table and you will hear people say that but if we it's keep inevitable. saying the word always and inevitable we'll never have the we'll potential never. consciousness and, and yeah. it's also the the um anthropological record the biocultural anthropological record um, shows that that's not true because human beings have the potential uh, to be, and as you said, um, actually, it, it, you know, it's it, it's a more a more adaptive in many, depending on the circumstance, to be caring and to be cooperative mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. Totally. And so, the n concept of a coward and the hero is part of the ideological armature of, of um, you know, this condition of militarism that um, you know has I mean my students they don't want to be cowards they want to be heroes but you have to unpack the, wor the words and understand this is where linguistic anthropology comes in as well because mm -hmm. we, t we take a word that we think we know what it means and we think we, you know it, we take it for granted but if you start to take it apart you start to see how powerful the word is because it evokes such powerful images and has us responding them to them in a certain way. What is it that we want to be? How do I want to be identified? Um, we hear it every time there is a news, a, you know, terrible news tragedy or somebody does something wonderful to help other people, they say, you're a hero, you know? Um, and then the person says, I'm not a hero, I was just doing my job or whatever. But they, this construct of hero, anyway, so you get the idea that, that um, you know, it's, um, um, this is all part of what we have to take apart to understand yes. humankind and, yes. and the meanings people attach to things, to words, to yes. ideas, and to practices. Yes, yes. And, if we, and to make that cultural shift, we have to put these the linguistical practices all into movement in order to make these changes, the geopolitical changes, etc. Mm -hmm. Let's touch on uh, my father's wars. Okay. Okay, so this is y about your father. Yes, yeah, so My Father's Wars, is, it, the full title is My Father's Wars, Migration, Memory, and the Violence of a Century. So you can see so much of my work and my interests are around these issues around displacement, dispossession, diaspora, war, uh, violence, um, and structural and systemic violence, as you said, and its, it's effects on human lives. And so um, I... Um, my father has a very interesting life history. He lived across the 20th century. He was born an Eastern European Jew in a place called Jedwabne, Poland. And um, his, his migration trajectory was from Poland to Cuba, to the United States, to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And uh, so he has this really interesting story that crosses cultures, language groups, um, continents, mm -hmm. uh, nation states, um, and wars. He lived through, he lived his, his, in the course of his life, he lived through two wars and a revolution. And um, so, and my father was a, not a very easy person to get along with, for me, anyway, I can speak for myself. And, uh, and but, but he also had, was a great storyteller and always had, storyteller and always had, um, was pretty open about talking about the past and I was very fascinated by his stories even as a child and then later it it um, uh, I won't go into all the background but it came to me 
that I really wanted him to be the subject of my of a study um, he, with him as the as the base as the heart of it but edge out from his life story to a larger social history so often in scholarly work we might look at a topic like let's say war and we might even look at a war or we might look at migration and look at a pattern of migration of these folks from there to here you know like that it's circumscribed and good but what I wanted to do was look at a life and look at it across all these terrains so that um, we could understand um, a multiplicity of forces but also change and transformation so to give you a hint a kind of a cultural hint about the changes my father his own life and bodies and you know is his name he was born Menachem Mendel Wasserstein and in Cuba in a little town called Manguito he became Miguelito because <laughs> Mendel is like it translates to Miguelito M M Mendeli is the diminutive in Yiddish he became Miguelito in Havana he became Miguel and then later he became Michael Waterston that's how I got my last name. What from an Bashishti. evolution of a name. An evolution of a name that suggests, and then at the end of his life in Puerto Rico, he was known as Don Miguel. So you can imagine, and, I, and there are photographs of him. You have a photograph of him from Poland as a little boy. He looks like it's from Poland from 19 teens, you know, um, 1920s. Then you have him in Havana. He looks like a you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, he, ha he has the whole aura of, of this young man in Havana. And then as an Ameri there's a photograph of him as an American soldier. He looks like an American soldier. Anyways, and so forth. So it's really interesting because those photographs too, those are artifacts that suggest meanings, very anthropological, very cultural. These are like different lives. They're different lives. But it's one life. But it's one life. And it's a life that reflects, um, it's, it's, it's what I tried to do in, t in telling the, my description of him was to show him, you know, in his, I, I wasn't going to put him up on a pedestal and I wasn't going to put him down, and, you know, and demonize him. I wanted to show him as a real live, a flesh and blood human being who had his strengths and his weaknesses and his faults and his assets and 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 he lived through a violent century and he m managed and adapted and maneuvered sometimes and um and i and it's a reflection of the human struggle and so we i call this my my colleague barbara rilko bauer and i developed a term for this approach of working with one's own parent and we call it intimate ethnography because i did this study cool as a daughter but as an anthropologist as well yeah. so it's an anthropologist daughter or daughter anthropologist yeah. study of her own father which is not something that's usually done in our field which we need to do more of because th there's not enough intimate ethnology intimate eth ethnography enough ethnography yeah, it, um, ethnography, the, the study of culture. Well, ethnography is um, an approach to research, but it's also the final product, your book. Okay, okay. And then um, eth 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 ethnography, customs of individuals and cultures. Yeah, you can okay. say it like that. Okay, and so we, I think we need more intimate ethnography because it will enable us to better document the evolution of different cultures and it's not just the evolution of cultures because um, but it's because that by using that word suggests that there is a trajectory but mm. it isn't so much a trajectory as it is um, at, at, at particular moments in time and in place you have people who um, or have organized themselves and, and, and understand their lives uh, and are in exactly. social relationship with one another and are in social relationship with the power structures that they find themselves in. And it's, in, it's a dynamic. It's, yes. in, it's a process and a dynamic. So it's not so much a, an evolution which is too linear to, you know, often we conceptualize evolution too linear in a, a linear way. A documentation of the variables that the 
person evolved within that that well, timeline that of existence. Mm -hmm. What their life was like, because all of the different variables that your father went through, the wars and the revolution and and changing it from a you know from a soldier to a, and a, the migrations, a, a, yeah, the migration and the movement and the not movements and social policy because his family tried to get to the U.S. in 1924, but the the U.S. immigration law changed it at that time to pre prevent people like my father from coming in just like it's so relevant to some of the things happening now mm -hmm. because they um, didn't want the riffraff in mm -hmm. they didn't want people from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe to come into the United States that were going to pollute the American mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. character yeah th there's there's this also this strange way that I started perceiving now <clears throat> intimate ethnography where I started thinking about well why not who do you choose to document who do you not choose to document because somebody that lives in a in a rural town for 80 years and they live and die in that rural town uh, maybe in the middle of the US or in the middle of anywhere else on the planet just you know, what why would it be important to document that you know that type of so I think everybody has a life history now anthropologists don't necessarily look at one individual like I did in this particular case I mean my study of women and homelessness I looked at many indiv many yes. people um, but um, but you know um, and you know anthropologists immerse themselves in a particular place and get to know people in that place and it's it's not necessarily the kind of thing that I did here. Um, although in our discipline we do have tradition of uh, doing life history research, you know, of individual life histories. Cool. Um, it, you know, everybody has a history, everybody's family has a history, and I know that uh, my uh, intimate ethnography, which is a life story, that's a social history. Because we are all social beings, so there's always going to be a social history that it, that that's behind, that surrounds that person that you just described, that imaginary person in the rural area. You know, where did they come from? Like they are not an island unto They're themselves. Not, yes. There's it, there yes. is something. There is a story there. But you is know, is there I've more had reason to document a Nobel laureate or someone that led a genocide? Is there more reason to document that? Well, that's interesting question because one of the things about my book, I think, is that is a contribution is that it's an ordinary person, and uh, you know, whose um, you know life history is relevant because it provides us insight into those larger social, the larger social history, and the larger dynamics and the interplay Correct. of the individual within that. Um, you know, so a biography of, of, a biography of a you know, famous person, I mean, that's, uh, that's not, you know, I mean, there's a, I, there's a time and place for everything, but as an anthropologist, I'm interested in the ordinary people and what their experiences are. And, uh, in, what and, that can and, teach us. And what that can teach us and, and um, about humanity. Yes, yes. Now, the other books along the way to Light and Dark Times, were those more about uh, justice and... Well, so I mentioned that I have a book on women and homelessness, yes. and that book is called Love, Sorrow, and Rage. Mm. And then the subtitle is Destitute Women in a Manhattan Residence. And the other book I have is um, Street Addicts in the Political Economy, it's called. And then I've done uh, edited volumes. Most wow. recent one is on gender in the Republic of uh, uh, in, in Georgia, which is um, the f in the former Soviet Union yeah. in the Caucasus. Yes. Um, uh, culture, nation, and history. It's a feminist perspectives on culture, nation, and history in the South Caucasus. And I have an edited volume on war. And I have an edited volume on writing anthropology, which is one of the things that I'm very mm -hmm. uh, keen on because I think it's very important for us anthropologists to um, we we know so much and we need to communicate what we understand about the world better to larger audiences and put be be voices in public conversations, which kind of leads me to Let's do it. light in dark times. Yeah. So um, if I can share that with you. Yes, and I also want to say out out of the you know when you were first starting to teach us about about John Jay College and the student body that's there at this public at this public college city college that this is a this is this is also one of the things that leads 
more conversations and more of your research. It's led it because you get to see firsthand um, diverse uh, women, uh, lower SES, mid SES, etc., socioeconomic status, and that surrounding yourself there, it gives you a better understanding of the the the, the violent uh, in, injustices um, that that are occurring in the um, in humanity. Well, um, we do have a very diverse student body, as you, as you as I said, and um, um, a lot of our students. I mean, they um, they struggle with um, uh, limited access to resources. We do have students who are homeless. We uh, too many of them. We have students who are food insecure. We most of our students work, and many of them work full time. I mean, wow. nearly all of our students work, and so they don't come from privileged backgrounds and yet they manage to accomplish enormous amounts and I'm very proud of them. <laughs> um, nice. So, but okay. let me tell you a little bit about Light and Dark Times, yes. um, the human search um, for meaning um, that... And it's so cool that it is, like I, when I saw that I, I got really excited because to me disseminating the complexity um, to the youth is really important. Right, so, so the, here's the, so you, what you just showed your audience is um, a flyer from a talk that my um, collaborator Charlotte Hollins and I just did at my school, which was a wonderful experience. Um, the first time we brought um, our collaborative work to an audience and it was great. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about it, mm -hmm. uh, really briefly. So, as, as you mentioned, I was president of the American Anthropological Association and my term ended last December. And the night before your term ends, you give a big address to um, an audience of anthropologists. So there were, I don't know, between 800 and 1,000 people in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I had, my address was at that time, my, my address was titled, Four Stories, Four Stories, A Lament, and an affirmation. Mm. And what it was, was a talk that was an engagement with Hannah Arendt and Bertolt Brecht about the dark times of the past and bringing them into the present. Mm. And I was talking to this audience of anthropologists about what I thought we need to be doing at this particular historical moment um, in these dark times um, as anthropologists and what some things and that was my four stories, the four things that I've come to say to this audience. So, unbeknownst to me, there was an artist in the audience, and her name is Charlotte Hollins. Mm. And she was mm -hmm. listening to my talk and um, was so inspired um, by the talk that she went back to her hotel room and spent the entire night drawing, making a visual representation of my talk. Yeah which I received the next day. Wow. And it is the most gorgeous. I felt so affirmed because wow. she understood so much of what I was trying to convey yes. in this gorgeous drawing. Yes. So I'm not going to go through details, but I will tell you that ultimately I got in touch with her. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, what do you think about if we work together and create a graphic book based on my talk? and your illustration. And that is what we've been doing since last January, first by Skype, she's in London, and then she came to New York to stay with me, and we have been working together since the end of June, with a little break in between where she had to go, she went back home, but she's, I'm here in San Jose, and she's back in New York. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, we've been, we finished about um, two thirds of the book, and what we have done there, with, in that drawing that you see there, there are two little characters, one mm -hmm. in red, and one in blue. Mm -hmm. And I'm the character in red, and she's the character in blue. Mm. And we go on this search and encounter mo many philosophers and thinkers um, and writers and anthropologists and political scientists and others who are going to help us understand the dark times of the past mm. and, the dark, and the dark times of the present but the light, that there's light there all mm. the way mm -hmm. through, mm -hmm. which is um, 
what the search is is not for we don't we're not optimistic if you think of the word optimism as okay everything's going to work out happily ever after but we're searching for meaning like we're searching for hope in the sense that in, in, in meaning of hope um, as we're going to make sense out of things and that's our so we're searching for understanding and knowledge and one of the one of the um, and, and we're, we're searching for mutual understanding on a gigantic scale that is one of what part of the search and um, and uh, where we can find that in part is through this rich store of anthropological knowledge about people everywhere and anywhere produced by anthropologists anywhere and everywhere and that is that is where we can lift the cotton wool of obfuscation that mm -hmm. pulls the wool over our yeah. eyes and um, and be and 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 under come to understanding by uh, the illumination mm -hmm. that we get through knowledge mm. and that is our book mm, that's so cool and okay. it's gorgeous and it's yeah, visually it's visually oh, incredible awesome awesome I love that so so now just tell us about this the the importance of piercing the veil and also seeing and then how that helps see the light and kind of like a little bit on that journey like how do you explain so the veil when we're on this journey and we are you know meeting these different philosophers there were the four stories that I mentioned earlier the four things for us to think about um, is that we really we need to, we all need to be introspective we need to reflect on ourselves and what our assumptions are what our beliefs are what our what our presumptions are and and really be honest with ourselves about um, our motivations and our attitudes and our beliefs so be introspective that's mm -hmm. really important for all of us yeah um, meditation is great for that <laughs> yeah and um, also we need to um, think in dark times that and and actually this is where Hannah Arendt comes in and I won't go into those mm -hmm. specifics right now but she she talks about what thinking is and it's thinking mm -hmm. is is not reasoning for example because mm. you know we can find reasons for all sorts of things and justify all sorts mm -hmm. of terrible things that's not thinking so we need to think uh, and be thoughtful in in these dark times in any dark times and what would you say thinking is then it's 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 akin to introspection but it's different because it's 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 really a silent intercourse with oneself yes um, and um, but it also requires um, uh, going beyond um, your own opinion about something. Absolutely, okay? it's, it's 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 not multi-perspective synthesis. That's that's one way to to put it. Um, and then the third the third uh, thing we really need to do um, is think about um, and understand truth, lies. And trivia the danger of the trivial so much of what we well we 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 know that we're living in a post-truth world if you will um, and um, and that it's very difficult to curate to know what's true and what's not true because it's because we're bombarded with information to parse for signal in all the noise exactly and um, also and 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 you know this is for anthropologists but for everybody we have to avoid the trivial and, and for for scholars we have to avoid producing the trivial we have to produce really important things not just stuff to to publish or to you know yeah. so forth you need it needs to be meaningful yes. it need, needs to be a contribution but we also have to avoid the trivial um, you know in terms of you know uh, we're so exposed to junk <laughs> yeah and uh, you know we have to avoid that because there's see, that stuff is distraction it's distracting and then we're we're and then then the darkness is is there 
There's a limited we allow it. amount of waking hours we have every day. Exactly. It's only 16 of them on average per human. So, so there's, if there's only 120 billion hours of collective human attention on the planet, if you direct as much of that attention towards knowledge and truth and multi-perspective synthesis as possible and away from the noise, exactly. then you're going to have more of a prosperous planet. And this doesn't mean that you can't relax your mind and look at something, you know, Totally. But it can't be all that we do, okay? It can't be all that we pay attention to. Yes. So there's that. And then the fourth thing is envisioning an alternative world. Yes. Because what we don't yes. do is allow ourselves the space yes. to imagine a different way of organizing the world. We don't do that. And we have to do that. Yes. We have to provide the space. And if we've gone through introspection and if we are thinking and uh, you know, if we are um, understanding what is, what are lies and different kinds of lies, because that's what we go through. We talk about uh, radical deception and what that is. Um, these are concepts. That's a concept from uh, you know Hannah Arendt also. Mm -hmm. But um, and she also talked about radical evil, by mm. the way. And radical evil mm -hmm. is, um, uh, you know, a system, a political economic system that turns human beings into superfluous, yeah. makes them superfluous, yes, yes. makes them redundant, makes them dehuma dehumanize. dehumanize. So yeah. all of these things are in this, um, <laughs> you know, search, Whoa. human search for meaning, all of this, and it's all visually presented in incredibly. Um, and I think, the, and then the, we get to this last piece, which is creating the space and the time to envision an alternative world and how that might look and not allow you know uh, not be not just um, uh, allow ourselves to um, be locked into an ism or an I some kind of ideology mm -hmm. but really like what is important to us and um, that piece in my talk and in the book is really very moving to me it goes full circle back to my students because one of, this, one of my students brought into um, class the idea of for us to do this. And so one of the things that we did one day in class was, um, and this student organized this event, this activity. He had each student write down on a piece of paper the most important thing that, he, that we thought as individuals to change, that needed changing for an alternative world. And he That's put them awesome. in, in a jar, yeah. and then we each had to pick out one person's thing, mm -hmm. which wasn't our own, yeah. and read it aloud. And mm -hmm. it was the most incredible, because when you mentioned earlier about caring and community, mm -hmm. everything that the students said were all about that. It was all about that. And uh, it was not about making money, and it wasn't about uh, getting material objects, uh, you know, accumulating material goods. It wasn't about any of those things. It was all about um, um, us becoming human beings who care about one another, love, and um, uh, love, and um, caring, and community, and Together, we'd be able to find the justice that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Because with that, we can then plan a new wo world yes. that is just. Yes. That is just. What a cool activity on each putting in one thing that we want to see us change in the world and then to read each other's out loud that is very cool and how often do we do we stop and think well what would it be what would be the template for an alternative world exactly and I've been I've, I've called that I guess now two words civilization design or planetary architecture these have been kind of like two phrases that I've been throwing around a little bit to feel out how people what people react to them but those phrases are exactly what slow down feel what would we want to design civilization as what would be an ideal architecture for the flow of resources to to people for flourishing on the planet mm -hmm. so 
and I love how you made it so clear about the about not getting lost in what's trivial because there are plenty of people trying to capitalize on you being lost in what's trivial. Yes. yes. Exactly. And yes. that's the thing that we're, we, we all struggle with this. We all struggle with it. So yes. that's, that's where, that's my, that's my work in a nutshell and, um, and where I'm at today. So, so um, when I get back to New York from the conference, Charlotte and I are going to continue to work on light in dark times. And we, um, we have a sense of urgency about this book project because we feel that, um, you know, uh, you know, these are, I mean, listen, we're here in San Jose, breathing in this air um, amidst, a, mm -hmm. you know, uh, people in power who tell us there's no issues with, with climate change. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, um, uh, you know, uh, we want the world, we want the world to be sustainable. It's worth sustaining. Yeah. And human life is worth sustaining. Yeah. And we all want to be safe. Yeah. Wow. Um, I feel so blessed. Thank you, Elise. Thanks for Thank joining you. us on the show. Thank this you has for been me. this has been such a pleasure. Um, I'm I'm just I, I have a lot of uh, love for what you care about and what you're writing about and what you're teaching. So Thank you so I, much. I greatly appreciate you coming Thank on. The you show. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank and you. This is this again I'm a I'm a, I'm a kid in a knowledge haven right now. It's so fun being here. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, check out AAA as well. There are links in the bio. Please give them a look. Um, and keep building the future. Go and manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Much love, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Wow. Great. I feel so, so good. That was, oh, great. I feel so, so enriched and like. Oh, you're so wonderful. Thank you. Yeah.